Hey grade 10, so today I will be discussing a new journal with you and it is called the General Journal. I will be discussing the format of the General Journal as well as um, certain transactions that go into the journal. This will be a two-part video which will consist of me showing you the format and then doing certain transaction with you and then my next video will be finishing off those transactions and completing an activity with you. So the general journal is like I said a new journal and the word journal is actually perfect for it because you can put a variety of different transactions into this journal. What we know about journals is that there are certain journals for certain things. So we know we've got cash journals, okay? And in those cash journals, we can record us receiving cash, which would obviously go in the CRJ, and we can record ourselves paying cash, which would then go in the CPJ. Then you learned about journals that deal with credit. We have credit sales, which we then record in the DJ. And we record as um, as well credit purchases, which goes into the CJ. You also learned about um, the Petty Cash Journal, which is whenever we bought using the Petty Cash box. Now, there are a variety of other journals which we've yet to co cover. Then we also have our journals for certain returns okay when debt is returned to us we put it in a DAJ and when we return to creditors we put it in a CAJ now as we read through transactions we can see transactions that happen more often and because they happen so often we created these journals for them so we know whenever we receive cash we'll put in the CRJ whenever we buy on credit, we'll put in the CJ. Now, these transactions that I'm going to talk about, they do not fit into any one of these journals. But these transactions also, they don't happen frequently. And because they don't happen frequently enough, we don't go and make a journal, a separate journal for them. So for all of these transactions that I'll introduce you to, they will all go into the general journal because of how infrequently they happen. And that is why we created the general journal is for these transactions that don't have a home, if you want to call it that. So I say here that the general journal is used to record a variety of transactions and they, they do not occur frequently. Um, and then I say that, therefore, they can't fit in any of the other journals. Um, in Now, every single journal has a specific format. So, for example, we know in the CRJ, we put a transaction, well, the amount into bank and into one other account. Or if you in the DJ, we put into the sales and the cost of sales column. So, the way that this journal works is that we will identify a debit transaction and we will identify a credit transaction. As well as, because the transactions are so random and infrequent, we also have to give a brief description of the transaction, okay? And that brief description is called a narration, which we have to identify in the transaction as well. Then, we have the source document, and it is called a journal voucher. Now, here is the format of our general journal. We have the source document column, which is the journal voucher column, and obviously these will follow in numerical order. Then we have the details column, and in the details column, so I explain it in depth, but what happens is in this details column, we will always identify the debit account first, no matter what. Okay, so whatever account is being debited, you have to write that account name first. And then the second line, we will always put the credits transaction. 
Now you can see I didn't write the word credit straight underneath the word debit. That is because whenever we are crediting an account, we have to indent it to show that the account is being credited. And we do this to show the account being credited because sometimes we might have two debit entries. So we have two debit entries, you'd place the accounts underneath one another, and then we can easily identify the credit entry when we see the indented account, okay? And then in the line underneath the credit account, we would then go ahead and write the brief narration. Now, the narration depends on the transaction that happens, and I've identified them later on in this booklet, and you have to know these off by heart. Um, you'll find later on in grade 10 and in grade 11, we actually leave the narration portion out. Now, we need to move on, and we've got the folio column. In the folio column, we will identify, and I've said here in point number five, um, we will identify the general ledger folio, so either the B1 or the N1 accounts, or B5 and N2, whatever it might be. And sometimes we even have to put the data or the creditor's ledger. So that's very important. We can't forget to leave that out. Okay. Then we have the debit and the credit column. So obviously for the debit account, you would put the amount there on the debit side. And for the credit account, you will put the amount on the credit side. Remember, these two have to be the same, okay? Your debits have to equal your credits, and you know that because of the double entry rule. Then, specifically, we have a debtor's control and a creditor's control column, okay? This is very important. I always say that it reminds me to go to the debtor's ledger as well. We can't forget. So whenever you have a debtor or a creditor's account, it becomes important to go into these columns. So if you're dealing with a debtor, you would enter into the debit column and you would also have to go into the debtor's control T account and debit that transaction as well. So obviously, as we do the examples, you understand. But what you must remember is whenever you are dealing with a debtor, you have to also enter the amount into the debtor's control account because this, the totals will get posted to the general ledger. Okay. Bear in mind that debtor's control is an asset, which means it works plus minus and creditors control is a liability which means it works minus plus so same thing here if one of the two accounts was a creditor you would enter it into the debit and credit column as well as the creditors control account as well please that is vital okay so that is the basic format and then the last thing that you are required to do is as soon as you are finished with the transaction, you need to underline underneath the narration to show that that specific transaction has been completed. Okay, so let's start with our first transaction that goes into this journal, and it is writing off bad debts. Now you can immediately see there the word bad Okay, I'm sure a lot of you have an idea about what this is, but if you have a bad debt, we need to think about who, who is in debt to us, okay? It is our debtors. Now, if we have a bad debt, that means that the data has been bad, and the only time you can imagine a data being bad is when he fails to pay us, okay? That is very upsetting because we rely on the fact that this data is going to come back over a certain period of time and pay us what he owes us. Now, if he doesn't pay us what he owes us, we are responsible for that. And that means if they have failed to pay us, that means we didn't make the sale, okay? We're not earning an income. And because we aren't earning that income, you can immediately see 
that that bad debt, when we experience a bad debt, it is an expense, okay? And it's an expense because we are bearing the brunt of that. It's causing a loss in our business. And why is it causing a loss? Because the debtor has taken our trading stock and we haven't received any income from it. So now we have to bear the brunt for that, which really is a problem. Okay, so now let's do an example. It says, a debtor who owed 360 Rand has been declared insolvent. Now, when a debtor is declared insolvent, it means that they do not have any cash. Okay? To pay back various debts. Okay? So, when they are being declared insolvent, we immediately know that bad debts is going to happen because we won't receive any money. But sometimes what happens, and you'll see it in this example now, is we get their lawyers, if you want to call them that, who will approach our business and say, okay, we know that our client, your debtor, owes you a certain amount. He cannot pay you the full 360. So they'll come and they'll say, okay, we know your debtor owes you 360. But unfortunately, he cannot pay this full amount. But what they say is, don't stress. What we can do is we can cover a certain portion of the debt. Okay, so what does that mean? Over here it says, his estate, so his lawyers, they say that they can pay 60 cents in the rand. Okay, and the remainder of his debt must be written off. So, if we look at this, okay, we know that one rand is made up of 100 cents, okay? Now, what his estate and what his lawyers are saying, that for every one rand that this data owes us, okay, they are gonna split it. So, they are going to give us some money. So, we are actually going to receive some money from his estate, which is awesome. We're super happy about that, okay? And then, the other portion of the money, the remaining portion, is going to have to be written off, okay? We aren't going to receive this money whatsoever. So, let's see. For every one rand, they are saying that the state is going to pay 60 cents in the rand. So, we are going to receive 60 cents for every one rand that the data owes us. So, if we look at that, we can easily work out that 40 cents we have to write off. We won't be receiving. So, let's see how much we are going to actually receive and discuss the journal. So, I always do the split like this. Okay. And then I say, okay, we are receiving some and some is going to be written off as a bad debt. Now, if we are receiving some money, we actually receiving money, in what journal would we enter this? The cash receipts journal, okay? This is like a normal debtor's payment, okay? It's as if the debtor is paying us back. So we're super happy about that, okay? And we know that what we are actually receiving is the 60 cents. Now, let's work out how much we're going to actually receive. So we take the 360 rand and we times it by 60 cents. So we get out our calculator and you do the transaction and we can see that. So I'll just leave my calculator quickly. 360 times by 60 cents and the amount is 216 rand. This is what we are actually receiving from the data. Now, bear in mind, I've said that this goes into the CRJ, people, okay? We're not even talking about the GJ yet. So, let's see if we can identify what would the debit and credit transaction for that be if we entered in the CRJ. Well, we know the main account in the CRJ is bank. And what's happening to bank? Well, it will be increasing because we actually are receiving the 216 rand. 
And then what's the contra account? Well, obviously, it has to be debtor's control. Why? Because it's a normal payment. So what's happening to the debtor's account? It is decreasing. Okay. Now, remember, this is a CRJ transaction. I haven't drawn up the CRJ in this example, but you would be required to complete a debtor's ledger. And in this debtor's ledger, we can see, okay, his account rendered, what he owes us is the 360. And now what we are doing is we have received 216 Rand from him and it would have gone in the CRJ. So what's the source document for the CRJ? It would have been, I prefer, just want to add it in there, a duplicate receipt, okay, CRJ. And look, it's on the credit side. Remember, a data is an asset which works plus minus. So if we're actually receiving money, what's happening to his debt? It is decreasing. So now he owes us 144 Rand. But now we have to remember, are we going to receive this 144 Rand? No. But let's see how they work that out. So we're going to take. Okay. And I just want to do it in a different color. The 360 times that by 0, 0,4 because 40 cents we're not going to receive. Okay, we can see that. And we get 144 Rand is the amount that we are not receiving. That is how much we are going to write off. This means that this 144 Rand we will never get from the data again. Okay, so where do we write off bad debts? Well, because it's a foreign transaction and it doesn't happen frequently, we do it in the GJ, okay? And that is us writing off his accounts, okay? We can't do it in the CRJ because are we receiving this 144 Rand in cash? No, we're not receiving it, okay? So now, this 144 Rand, we have to write it off. So remember, bad debts is an expense, okay? And expenses increase on the debit side. So for those of you who know me best, I always used Alice. Assets, liabilities, income, capital, expenses, and drawings. Plus, minus, 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 plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, 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 minus. Okay, so we need to identify the two accounts affected. We know for sure one is bad debts, okay? And the other account has to be the debtor's account because we need to get that debtor's account to decrease. But let's just classify and just double check which account we need to debit and credit. So I classify and I say, what type of an account is bad debts? Well, it's an expense. What type of an account is debtor's control? It is an asset. Then my next step is to identify whether they're increasing or decreasing. So what's happening to the expense? It's increasing, it's getting bigger because we're never going to get that money back. And then what's happening to the debtor's account? If we're writing this out of the books, we're saying you don't have to pay us it, well, the debtor's account is going to decrease. So if we have a look at it, expense plus, expense plus. So we need to debit bad debts, and then credit debtors control. And that is how you complete this transaction. But now, we need to focus on this debtors section because when we enter this into the GJ, it becomes important that just like when we were in the CRJ, in the details column, we didn't write debtors control. You would write the debtors name. Same as when we're in a GJ. When we come into the GJ, we'll say, Debit bad debts, you can see it's the debit account because I've written it first. And then we need to credit debtors control, but you cannot write debtors control. You have to write the debtors name. And look at how I have indented it, okay, to show that it's being credited. Then I put the amounts. Remember, the amount was 144. So bad debts, debit, and I put the amounts, 144. 
credit J. Wade, who's the debtor, 144. And please remember to put his debtor's ledger number because you, are, you mustn't forget, you have to go to his debtor's ledger to write off the debt completely. Now remember, at the beginning of this lesson or this video, I said that whenever we're dealing with a debtor or creditor, we cannot forget to go into the specific T account. So what are we dealing with? A debtor. And what do we need to do to the debtor's account? We need to credit it. Okay. Why are we crediting it? Because his account is decreasing. We're writing off that debt. Then you need a narration because remember, it's a foreign entry. So you have to explain what you've done. And specifically, we say 40 cents in the rand written off as irrecoverable. Okay. Once you've written the narration, you know that you've perfectly finished off the transaction. And we go ahead and we underline the transaction so that we know that we are ready for the next one. Now, you can't forget, you've got lots of reminders here. The debtor's name, his ledger, the debtor's control, okay? You have to go to his ledger. So in his debtor's ledger, we make the transaction. We specifically say bad debts, GJ's the journal, decreasing his account because we're writing it off. And look, his account has been written off. It is now at zero. And what is so important to remember here is that he is no longer our data. He is completely written out of our books. It's almost as if we take this ledger and we rip it out of our records. We just do not remember him whatsoever. Okay. So he is no longer our debtor at all. And that is how we do bad debts. Nice and easy. I'm not going to talk in depth now about the totaling of the columns and posting to the general ledger. I'll do a separate lesson on that. Then a nice and easy one. And it's our second transaction for the GJ is when the owner takes stock for personal use, drawings of the owner. Now, what we are used to whenever we spoke about drawings is that we had a transaction that said the owner withdrew cash for personal use, or it would say, issued a check on the owner's behalf, issued a check to buy the owner lunch, issued a check to pay for the owner's insurance. Now, what's important here is that cash element. That's what you were always dealing with in the junior grades, cash. So immediately you, know, you knew whenever the owner withdrew cash, that means our bank account was decreasing. So we would go and enter this into the CPJ, okay? But now, the owner is entitled to more than the business's cash. He is allowed to withdraw anything from the business, whether it is vehicles, um, stationery, consumables, trading stock. He is entitled to all of that. Now you can see, if the owner to with, was to withdraw, so let me write this here. If he were to withdraw stock, we need to think, okay, what are the two accounts affected? We've got trading stock, because that's what he's taking out. And if he's taking out stock for personal use, the other account has to be drawings. Then we classify. But what's important here, when I look at this, is bank involved? Okay, do we have bank here? No, we do not have bank. Therefore, we cannot enter this into a CPJ. This has to be entered into a GJ because it's such a foreign and different transaction. So let's check how this would work. What do I always do? Classify the account. So I say, what type of an account is trading stock? It's an asset. 
And then when I'm using Alist, so most of you will do drawings as owner's equity, but for me, drawings is the D in Alist. Then I say, okay, what's happening to our trading stock amount if the owner is withdrawing the stock? Well, the trading stock amount is decreasing because he's taking it out of the business. And then I say, okay, what is happening to drawings? The drawings amount is increasing. So if I look at Alice, I'll see, okay, A minus has to be credit and D plus has to be debit. So there we go. We've just seen how does an owner withdraw merchandise? We need to debit drawings and we need to credit trading stock. Okay. So let's have a look at the example. But yeah, this is a very nice and easy one. So here we go. What I want to really um, highlight here is that the owner always takes stock at cost price. Okay, why does he take it at cost price? So I'm just going to make a note here. Because he cannot make a profit off of himself. Okay, he cannot make a profit off of himself. And why do I say that? Because when he's withdrawing the stock, it is not the same as sales, okay? He's not buying the stock. He's taking the stock for personal use. So whenever he does that, please, it must be at cost price. Often, what we'll do is we'll give you an example where we give you the selling price, you then have to identify that trick and you have to go and work out the cost price. Please, that's very important. So here we go. We've got R. Martins, the owner of Sound Incorporated. Okay, so R. Martins is the owner. He took a CD player from the stock for his son, 3,200 Rand. And we can just assume that that is the cost price. Okay, so what do we do? We know the two accounts affected are drawings and trading stock. Okay, you can classify them, but you'll start to learn by, um, off by heart that this is the debit and credit entry. So we'll say, okay, debit drawings. See, we always identify the debit account first, 3,200 Rand into the debit column. And then what do we need to credit? Trading stock, and look how it's been indented to show that it's a credit entry. Why is trading stock being credited? Because it is an asset that is decreasing with 3,200 Rand. Do you see these two amounts are equal, okay, because of the double entry? Then ask myself, am I dealing with a debtor or a creditor? No, you're not. So you do not enter into the debtors and creditors control. And the last and most important thing in order to complete the transaction is to say the owner took goods for personal use. If you were to take stationary, you could replace that word. You could also say also say owner takes stock for personal use. If he takes consumables, you can say consumables, whatever it might be. And then don't forget to underline the transaction to show you are finished. Okay, so in my next video, I will then go and explain the next transaction, which is interest charged on overdue debtors.